You guys do exercises? Do you do like the like bop, 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 before you go up? Skibbity bop bop. Oh, like a vocal warm up? <laughs> do, you, do you run around the block <laughs> listening to Metallica or anything like that? I open my throat <laughs> up. Yeah? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh. If someone if someone did that at the mic, I would at, at a mic I would ban them for oh, sure. Oh man. I have uh, yet to be banned like at a mic. Uh, but who knows? Once we start up again, I may get a few bands for my throat stretches. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, 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 oh. I've seen a guy like Eminem shadow box uh, with his like notes, like, <laughs> like, and I'm like, what? <laughs> who are you banging over the head with these jokes? Damn. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So this is the second episode of So Tell Us uh, with David Moses Feinberg and Jared. Hello. 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 Uh, we have a great guest today that we're excited to introduce. Please welcome the very funny Kirk Griffiths. Uh, Hello, listeners and watchers. Uh, Kirk, we are uh, we're excited, as I said, to have you here. Um, excited to be here. We start usually with these questions, like a who, what, why, or when, why, but we just do who, where, when, and why. So who are you? Where did you start comedy? When and why? Uh, uh, my name is Kirk Griffiths, um, but depends on where you know me from. Some people strictly know me as Keith. Um, I have a few childhood friends that know me as Melvin. A lot of my hip hop internet friends, they know me as Rosebud, but we won't get into that part. Um, Rose, Rose Spoon? Rosebud, R-O-S-E-B-U-D. Um, shout out to Citizen Kane, all my film people, what's good? Um, so yeah, so uh, my name's Kirk, uh, doing comedy. I've been, the first time I ever did comedy was 2011. And uh, I would say consistently doing comedy uh, for the last five years. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much my basis. Uh, does this question involve my religion as well? Do I disclose my religion? I don't, I don't know what no. they want from yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, you have to expose your religion here at the world. And if we don't like it, we kick you out of the chat. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, you guys, you guys have the same religion. policy as Arby's. That's why I'm, they don't like that over there. You yeah. like when you ring the bell, but are you are you? <laughs> religious or whatever are you uh, oh no that was just i was making it a little knock knock i'm not a particularly re religious person um oh, if i had to gosh. describe as any label maybe agnostic would be the closest one you're like the snake religion you love snakes so you're like so, i love <laughs> i mean it's if religion's what you love uh then snakes will be in there snakes battle rap uh and professional wrestling that's my religion right there and my mom you know shout out to my mom <laughs> So you're kind of like all over the place though with comedy, like where you travel though. Like you, you, I know you're in Plymouth Meeting, correct? No, I'm in Downingtown. Downing. I was in Plymouth Meeting though. Okay. Um, yeah. But then, but then it's mostly traveling to Philadelphia, Lancaster, Harrisburg, Bethlehem, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. All throughout Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, the first open mic I did was at the comic strip in New York, oh. um, and wow. I did a few comedy stuff while I was out there, but predominantly most of my stand-up's been in Pennsylvania. You, that's crazy, because you don't hear about the comic strip much. Other than like that last Seinfeld thing, I don't hear people talk about it that much, but it is and a good club. Uh, Eddie Murphy, I also yeah. started it. Yeah. That's the, Eddie Murphy's the first person I think of when I think the comic strip. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It was cool, it was like, when you first start doing comedy, a lot of times you don't know, like, oh, just go to an open mic, and oh, open mics are free most of the time. So I went there and it was like, all right, pay $14. You have to bring five people. They're also paying $14. Wow. They probably have to get two drinks. I don't remember that part. Um, yeah, but right. they do record your set and the person that put it together. Um, she was kind enough to call me beforehand. We talked for like an hour. So it was a whole experience. It was nice. So the first show you ever did was a bringer show, basically? Yeah, and I don't even know if it was necessarily a show. I guess it was. It was like a because they presented it as like, oh, here's an open mic, but they're paying people to get in, and it it was very much like a show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Were you aware at the time of a, like how much uh, weight was held by the comic strip and like how big of a like venue that was? No, I understood that it was like a prominent place, um, 
but I don't think I had the foundation or comedic knowledge to recognize the heaviness of it. Um, I just recognized like, oh, this is a known place within comedy. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Where was the, where would, like, where was your home that you would always do it? Like you wouldn't miss a mic. Where did you start with that? The first one I would say is Laughs on Fairmont. It used to be an urban saloon. And um, oh, okay, yeah. I think they moved it now. It's like um, Laughs on Ortley. It's like kind of like evolved over the years. Um, yeah. But that was, it was right um, across the street from the Eastern State Penitentiary. Mm-hmm. And that was one where like, I called the host. I think it was like Caroline Buse at the time. And because I was like, I don't want to show up and no one's there and I'm waiting all this time. Um, but it was cool. You know, saw a lot of people that are still around, like in the Philly scene. Um, and that was one that I went to consistently. Gotcha. How did you do that first time at the comic strip? At the comic strip? Not bad. Not bad. I, I had all my everything meticulously planned out. Like I wrote a script and I was in um, I was in a, my old school in New York. Like they had just an empty block. It was a summertime. And I was just down there reading the whole script and timing it. So it was very like robotic. Um, yeah. But did I went you, back and what's up? Did you do the thing where you like the first time you wrote stand up, you like, <laughs> you wrote it like there was going to be applause breaks? Because I think like that's what I. Right. Uh, no, I don't think I did. I, I, I didn't speed through it. Hmm. I, that's one. I think I may have just had the confidence of like, all right, well, I'll know when this break when needed um so yeah I, I don't remember doing that but it was word for word um right. so no missing that part all right is that something that you uh, is that something that you still do or you work like a buy the book right out the script kind of guy or do you find that you're more like a loose off the cuff kind of a thing i'm less off the script than that experience but i would say i'm pretty on script um it also depends on how comfortable i'm feeling um, you know, if I'm trying something new out, I'm going to want to be like, all right, make sure to get those beats. But if it's just like, all right, I'm at a mic, I'm having fun. Like if it's a mic I'm familiar with, especially, then yeah, I just kind of let loose. Yeah. That sounds like ridiculous thing to say, I just let loose. I just let my hair down. <laughs> I, uh... like, beautiful jazz comes out of the mic. It's <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say like, I've seen you do comedy a fair amount of times and yeah, you seem like a pretty on the script guy. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's comics that do that. And like, uh, I mean, for the first year, I think I did that. Like, I didn't want to like, you know, make any waves or anything like that. Like I was kind of scared. Like I remember the first time I like looked up something of like, I'm going to do comedy. Is there like a video on YouTube? That's like a, you know, like a tutorial or something. It was just hecklers. So like at first I was terrified. Of <laughs> that just seems like, you're like, yeah, I'm going to do comedy. Let's just start in the epicenter of comedy, like New York City. I would just yeah. be terrified. But, yeah. I mean, that's well, the a- thing is when people are like, you move somewhere and someone's like, it's tough to make it there. It's like, yeah, but what about the people who live there? You know what I yeah. mean? Like they, you know, they're not going to North Dakota and then, you know, coming back, you know. Yeah, and not all people in New York are trying to make an entertainment. Some of them just have a steady life working at UPS. Um, so yeah. that's the thing there. And it was also with Comic Strip, it was the closest one there. Like I was in New York, I was living in the Bronx at the time, and I was taking a UCB class, and it was just like, oh, here's stand up. Um, yeah. Not realizing that's New York, and there's literally open mics all over the place. Um, Did you do improv as well? That was kind of my introduction to comedy. Yeah, I took a UCB class in 2011. I've been like 20 or 21. And yeah, that was that just. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Or UCB, they had their this week, I guess they shut down um, in New York. Yeah, scaling back a bunch of classes and stuff like that, right? Yeah, well, they, I think they're permanent, not permanently. They're closing it down and they plan on reopening, just not in a bigger venue. Um, kind of like how when they originally came to New York, they are in that small space. They're going to kind of go back to that from what I've been reading, at least. I, I think that that's, I don't, people have been talking about that a lot. And I, I went to the Hell's Kitchen space and it seemed Chelsea's. like it was way too, like, or, uh, yeah, like, uh, it just seemed like it was way too big to, like, hold itself. Do you know what I mean? Do you mean the Black Box Theater? The one that was in, like, Chelsea? I think so, yeah. Because I, I was working, I worked at Comic Con one year and I walked past the Javits Center to the, there's like a, there was a newer one that I'm pretty sure was in Hell's Kitchen. 
and uh, it, it seems like it was just like too big for its britches. I, mm. I'm saying all this to say, uh, w did you have something that sort of pulled you away from improv and pushed you further towards stand-up? Was there, was there like a click moment or do you still sit in that and try to live in those, both those worlds? No, it's definitely, I gravitated towards stand-up. I actually, the first time doing stand-up was in the middle of taking that improv class. Cause I was like, oh, you know, I'm this, that whole summer I was dedicated to comedy. And after doing that, after doing stand-up, I recognized that improv is really fun. Uh, a lot of times I think more positive too. And it's a good team building thing. I've met a lot of cool people there that I'm still friends with. But in terms of what I thrive off or like what I really enjoy doing and without having to have to have someone like pull my arm to do it. It's more so stand up. That's, that's funny. Like people always describe uh, improv as team building, but like when, you know, uh, whatever company AT&T needs to do team building, they always just go to a, uh, like a puzzle room or whatever. That's like <laughs> escape room. Yeah. Throw those people into an improv show. <laughs> All right, here you go. Yeah. I I always. The thing though, is like, corporate events that that like corporate improv things have you ever seen those things before like uh that's real yeah. they'll bring like like yeah they'll bring like an improv instructor to okay. a, a corporation yeah. and like teach them all improv and so i'm a big believer in improv but i can i can imagine nothing almost less exciting than like if like a, a corporate event at the comcast center where you have to teach a bunch of like Comcast programmer, some fucking like yes and or zip zap zap or some shit like that. I remember the first time I, um, well, I mean, I guess I like watched it like whatever was on Comedy Central. There's people who are improv people or whatever, like you know. But um, I'm pretty sure Reno 911 was all like improv people. But anyway, uh, the first yeah. um, the first time I ever saw improv, it was a friend of mine who uh, you guys might know, T.J. Hurley. Uh, he's a comic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah He's like yeah i'm gonna be on this show if you want to come see it this was like 10 years ago or something and i was like yeah and he's like yeah there's like an improv troupe in the middle so i don't really know what to tell you you know what i mean but like yeah just stick around yeah. and i was like okay like whatever i could do that and i remember to this day i don't know why i just have this vivid memory of like two stand-ups and the host was like, all right, make uh, make some noise for, like, the tissue box players or something, you know? And, like, <laughs> literally everybody was like, I'm going to smoke a cigarette. Like, you know, just like, and that was my intro to improv. And, like, but now I have so many friends like David and yourself that, like, I respect who do it. It's just crazy that, like, people start with that and then they go to stand up too but yeah. yeah it's 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 interesting just the how it's perceived within comedy like the different branches of it i mean, i've talked to a lot of improvisers and stand ups too where a lot of times it could feel like improvisers are looked down upon mm -hmm. um and it's seen as kind of like yeah. the silly cousin of stand up that yeah. can't really be taken yeah. too seriously um and even if that is the case i think it's good that it's there and comedy is big enough where you can have a bunch of stand up, um, and then you could also have an avenue for something like improv. It's a different type of muscle. Yeah, it seems like stand up is like the John Wayne of comedy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like people think that like because stand ups would like smoke cigarettes yeah. on stage and stuff like that, and like it's like I'm not gonna pretend I'm a unicorn on stage. I don't know what <laughs> that was, but yeah, I'm not an astronaut. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that. It's funny, I was about to say, uh, it's the Andrew Dice Clay of stand-up, and I was like, oh wait, that is a person, and he does stand-up. It's <laughs> not a good analogy. I should not chose one Yeah. Uh, Kurt, do you, have, uh, do you think that you have anything that you took from improv that you think really lended itself to your stand-up, that like, uh, like elements that you think that people, either that you held on to, or things that you think people should hold on to that like really inform some of your comedy not so much but i would imagine if i had to say one thing that you could take from improv that you really should bring into stand-up and honestly in life is truly to the yes end like yes end a situation like say if you are in a nightmare situation where you're getting heckled don't stray away from it it's like all right well i'm here now i agree that you're calling me a piece of shit how do i yes <laughs> sure. end this uh, uh, so like just kind of going with the flow and that's something that's probably the best thing that I got out of improv because like you, if you apply that to like 
at an old job, and I'm not digressing too away from the question, um, at a job where I was working with adults with autism, and one of the main things I did with one of the clients was he wanted to date, he wanted to get a girlfriend, and from there I was like, oh, okay, well, a good way to engage in conversation is to hear someone out and agree with it, not even necessarily agree with it, but acknowledge right. it, and then elaborate on it. Um, and I find that's one of the, it's just this very simplified way of looking about how to go about life. So I think that's cool. That's it's nice. It's refreshing. You, know? it's um, really so you touched on it a little bit, but we always kind of try to ask this one. Uh, uh, Benny, Benny was saying that he bombed in front of his dad, but you were talking about that. antlers. Yeah. Have you, yeah. have you, what's like your worst one so far? Oh man, I've had it both in Reading. <laughs> both in Reading, man. It's so rough. Uh, one of the more notable ones was I was at um, the Reading Comedy Outlet, um, Heiser Lanes. If you haven't checked out Heiser Lanes, I recommend it. I haven't been there in over a year or so, but I recommend it. Um, there, we we was just, it's like a low key mic at the time. You know, people are smoking indoors. Uh, I don't encourage that. Just put that on record. Um, and there's someone came in from the Eagles game outside. Uh, they came in and they began heckling some of the comics and then they quiet down. I'm on stage and then they started doing its meme. And this is probably one of the few times where I was like, you know, I'm going off the script and I was feeling myself that night and I just went off on them. Not like, you know, then like call them much like derogatory terms or anything like that, but I went off and it got a good response. And I remember his name to his day. It was Cliff. Uh, Cliff, he was very adamant. About it. I remember he like he insinuated that he was my uncle at some point. It was wild. Um, that was one a bad one. And then there was another one where almost a fight broke out at the public house. In uh, I don't know if you guys remember Powder Jacobs. Uh, he ran a room at the public inn in Reading, and it was the first time they ever did that show. It was like me, Matt Johnson, Lemare, and then like Mike Boyer. And then there's it was pretty filled out, pretty filled out. This woman, she kept like, you have you ever seen the ones that they're not necessarily heckling, heckling, they're engaging in the show just in a kind of annoying yeah. way. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. They're not taking the rhetorical side. Wait, it's like you say something and it's like we all been there or something, you know? Yeah. Like okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I I was going into a thing about how I hate spoilers, and she's like. Um, She's like, yeah, I hate spoilers. Oh, they're the worst. And I was like, you're really, I'm glad you agree. But like, yeah. <laughs> it pretty much, it escalates like engagement with her and I. And it was like, that was cool. It was, it was kind of just going like, you know, customer service, just treat it like how it is. But then someone got mad at her for interrupting me. And then their husbands started getting mad at each other. And then like, it was, I remember it felt like I was a teacher. I was like, all right, hey, listen, everyone. I'm glad you guys are, you know, engaging in the show. But, you know. I kind of want to go, you know, we're here. A lot of these performers, they came from a long way. Um, and if we could just give them a minute, if you want to talk, you know, you go outside, if you need to use the bathroom, feel free to. Um, and then I got an applause break just from being a facilitator. It was, so, so it's like, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an epiphany in terms of comedy, but it was an epiphany in terms of the, I could totally be a substitute teacher. And that's what yeah, you like. have <laughs> that, you have that voice of like, the principal's like, everybody calm down and no one cares. And then Mr. Griffiths is like, hey guys, uh, uh, here's, here's the deal. <laughs> and then like, everyone's like, oh, he wears Jordans. Let's listen to him. You know, like, <laughs> That's why I think it's yeah. in the hand movements and the melodic tone. Uh, melodic you, tone. Yeah, definitely. I feel like you would be like, you would be like the, um, not uh, the not Morgan Freeman in Stand by Me or whatever, but it would be like you'd be like the cool substitute teacher who like came in, but you uh -huh. were like a plant. Oh, <laughs> they <laughs> you in to like calm the school down and get better test scores. And stuff. Yeah, I'm over there like trying to raise those SATs and also raise their heart, mind, and spirits. If you ever care about these kids, he's taking you into his office and uh, he's saying this school ain't never going to change and don't you dare try or something. Nah. And he's still like, uh, <laughs> a cigarette on the desk or some shit. What's, is that the movie I was talking about? Does anyone know that? It's like, I think Lean it's, on me. Lean on me, yeah. Lean on me. Yeah. Oh, so when he takes the kid up to the roof, well, you smoke crack, don't you? Now jump. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging a child off the roof. <laughs> that happened in that movie? Was that, was that a scene? That's why. Yeah, yeah. I recently, I recently you see him. That movie. <laughs> it's great. It's a great movie. Um, it is a good one. 
That's a you loved him. Yeah. Uh, do you remember? That was like one of those movies that was on TBS every Saturday at three. You were yeah. like grounded. And you had- <laughs> it was Lean on Me, then Hardball. You'd watch. <laughs> Just kidding. Also, I think TBS owned the rights to Friday and Next Friday because it was. Oh, oh man. Uh, I just watched. I watched Friday last night. I was like, this movie fucking still holds up. I love yeah, <laughs> Friday is a phenomenal shit. movie. I put Friday maybe in my top thirty of all time. Wow, do the top twenty nine. I want to hear it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but so in that in that question uh, comes. Uh, this is like my favorite one to ask a comic, but uh, oh, oh. we didn't do it on the last one. But oh, I, I mean, in my weird. like personal life. But no, it's like your first joke like if you're still using it don't burn it but like right. you remember the first thing that you wrote down like you were going to go to the mic and say it like that's i don't know i love that yeah no um i remember both of them N- neither of them are appropriate uh grad i i one of my big influences starting out was anthony jeselnik okay. so kind of within that realm um i'll give you one of them it was like um it would be my closer too it was like i didn't do it the first time it's stand up uh, it was pretty much like, uh, you know, it's, it's cool. You know, you guys have been pretty cool so far. So I want to let you know who I am as a performer. Um, when I was younger, I, I walked in on my father touching my younger brother. Uh, I'm less than, he was molesting my younger brother. Oh, I mean, to sugarcoat it. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that's like, you know, get anyone upset and, you know, I, I you can only imagine how it was for my family and you can imagine how it was for me. I always thought I was the favorite and that was pretty much the joke that I would do. And, then, and I always wondered that, that holds up. You don't, do yeah, that it's, not, it's not a bad joke. Um, it just doesn't, in terms of like what I talk about now, it's just like, where the fuck did that come from? Like, where, it'd be like, where did that come? Where did that come from? But if you can get people to laugh about, any subject that's not like super malicious you know what i mean like that's yeah. a malicious joke like that like yeah do it I, i've watched you know uh i won't say it or burn the joke but i watched a, a comedian do i watched tons of comedians try to do jokes like that and fall on their face and then i watched this one comedian who's very successful now uh in the philly scene he does a joke and i remember being like holy shit he's doing this joke at helium in front of all these people and it was like everyone erupted and i was like they're nice. talking about molesting a child it's like if it's funny it's funny you oh know? yeah and that's like that's the coolest thing that's dude i like that joke thanks but yeah it's i i still enjoy it it's just i don't i rarely tell it but i could recognize like oh yeah no that's that's a decent joke david do you remember yeah. your first joke uh oh yeah i think i i remember one of the ones that i did uh my first set ever was um I used to have one, and it didn't really have a punchline so much. And this is a criticism that I still get about a lot of my jokes, is that it's just discussion and, like, what a, what's up with that kind of a thing. It was about the song um, That's How I Beat Shaq by Aaron Carter. <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> it was, uh, I was talking about, like, he has the whole, like, experience where he's, like, um, where he's where he like he wakes up from this dream that he's beaten Shaq at a game of basketball and he goes if that was a dream if that wasn't real how did I get a jersey with the name O'Neal and I was like that's not a thing you should question like you can buy one in any situation no where you don't have to beat Shaq at a game of basketball to get a fucking jersey. What are you, an idiot? Like, <laughs> and it, it did, I remember. It, I remember doing pretty well at a uh, Sage Cafe. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, no, no comic strip, but uh, we used to have to compete with an ice machine. So oh, it was, uh, pretty, like, that's good. I like that. That's, I like that. Yeah, that is good. Is I think now good? that it's you. Now that you're a more defined comedian and you know your style and stuff like that, it probably works way better than it did that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's definitely. It was definitely one of those things where, like, I, I mean, I've like, I still have the notebook from like the first sets that I ever did and things like that. Wow. And that one, I remember like, be, just being like, "Fuck it, I'll just like go into it." Because I was improv first, so I was like, "If you just have a premise, you can just into it." And then that was like one of the ones where I really learned about you know writing. 
Yeah. In a big way. Now, w real quick, uh, when they for both of you, I'm curious. Your first times doing it, did they introduce you as it being your first time doing stand up? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, think I was I like I was like sixteenth on the list, maybe eighteenth, something like that. It was probably like twenty people. Mm. It was at the Lizard Lounge, actually, and uh, yeah. Uh, first joke I remember the first joke I ever said on a microphone was, um, uh, "Hey guys, how's it going?" Blah blah, and I was like. Uh, yeah, so, and I had note cards. Like, I, oh, I thought, God. like, I, I don't know, whatever, I had note cards. I just needed You were in your dad's suit with really long arms and a I wore them. I, I want to tell you guys. <laughs> I had an office job at the time, and someone had, uh, I don't know if it was, like, a gift or something, gave me, like, a Ross gift, cer gift certificate, <laughs> and uh, it was for, like, $20. So it's like, I'm gonna have to put my own money into getting something now from this gift certificate. And I had like a, a Volcom Polo. <laughs> like, the, like the worst brand <laughs> that I had a Polo of. I had a Volcom Polo and I have no so cards. Beautiful. And uh, I said, yeah, my name's Jared, blah, blah, blah. I was like, hey, this, this, uh, this presidential election, that was crazy, right? Uh, yeah, I didn't know who to vote for. I got really confused when I was voting. Uh, I watched all these ads. I was so confused by all the ads. I ended up voting for Geico. <laughs> that was, like the, that was like the first it. joke. It's like, I'm, you, I'm, I'm, I'm slamming thing? Geico. Uh, Holding a note card, you go, I, I ended up voting for Geico. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, dude. Literally, yeah. like, like uh, and then, yeah, and then I just remember being like, people were like, ah! Like I got one of those. Where it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a pop. Yeah. That's and, not uh, a bad joke. And I remember the first time a joke didn't work was in that set. And I said, I talked to a friend the other day. I still love this joke, but I said, I talked to a friend the other day and uh, they made a really funny Instagram post. And I was trying to show it to someone. And then I looked at, for their Instagram and it wasn't there. And I asked them, did you delete your Instagram? And they said, yeah, actually, uh, no, I disabled my account. And I was like, it, Hey pal, it's 2018. You special needs to your account. Uh, I, I, can, I can still hear you doing that joke right fucking now. <laughs> I know. It's awful. It's awful. But like that was my process. Like I learned from one liners. And I feel like a lot of comics start with one liners when in reality you should build from the one liner. But you know what I mean? You think it's like right, yeah. I gotta get some and then five minutes at first. Was that for you guys? Like five minutes was like you're sweating bullets and it went so fast. You know it did I mean? go by fast. Yeah. I remember, I think I did maybe two or three bits my first time. I remember thinking, whoa, that kind of zoomed by. I also remember not yeah. feeling like I was nervous or on stage. I was like aware that I was doing stand up. It felt robotic because I rehearsed it so much, but I was like, okay, well, that's going to be the next word. That's going to be the next word. I think you're cruising right now. It felt very much like that. It did go by fast yeah it's insane that the first experience that you have with that like mine was at a fucking coffee shop like with mm -hmm. no one there yours was at the comic strip like yeah like one of the most famous venues in the entire world to do stand-up and you were like this is kind of going like <laughs> if i did it set now like five years in i would still be like i'm fucking doing the comic like <laughs> yeah. it's crazy kirk could you tell us a little bit about like because the first jokes that you said, like the joke example that you gave us was very much like an Anthony Jeselnik kind of a thing, right? Very much a shock value kind of a thing. For some of the people um, like listening to this uh, later on, could you tell them a little bit about, like if you had to put yourself in a certain kind of a box, like what kind of a style of comedy it is that you do and a little bit maybe about how you got to that kind of style? Yeah. Um... I always like to, if I had to think of it one way, and this is how I'd like label my personality, uh, peculiar with the twist of positivity. Uh, I think a lot of people may walk away from my stand up with thinking that. Um, a lot, not a lot of it is about me. Like if you see my stamp set, you're not gonna really know, oh, that's his trials and tribulations. That's what he worries about at night. When he looks in the mirror, that's what he sees. You're not going to see that from my comedy. Um, a lot of it's very kind of just absurd uh, jokes. Um, there are still one-liners in there. I like popping those in. Um, I touch on race, but it's nothing too heavy. It's very much like, I want to almost say like the TBS 
the TBS of the channels where it's like, okay, well, this is lighthearted. This is pleasant. We can rely on this. It's good. You're, uh, you're making like Mark Paul Glossier references. No, I'm just kidding. It's, no, it's honestly, the second joke that I ever came up with, the one that I didn't tell, yeah, it's the Saved by the Bell reference in there. And it gets uh, heavy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it's no. awful. Uh, but yeah, that's, I, I like to think of it like that. It's very much like, oh, this is, this is pleasant. Um, almost like a, and I don't want to jump into questions. I don't know if you're going to ask this eventually, but it's almost like a, almost like a Todd Berry-ish. Um, where it's very much like, you may not laugh out loud and howl, but you will be pleased. You will have a delightful time watching this. Do you like the, the thought of like, um, uh, do you like the thought of being a comic that you say something and people, like you said, they don't howl, but then maybe later they're at work and they think of it and then yeah. they're like, oh, wow, that was really good. That's really fun. And they say it to their friend or something like. Yeah, honestly, I'm okay with it. Their howl, that's cool as well. Um, <laughs> from my experience, so I don't really have a howl-inducing delivery or cadence. Um, I'm not really up in your face. Um, so if it's something that just resonates with them, that they, you know, it hits them later, that's cool. I uh, enjoy that. So you feel like a Todd Berry, you're saying? Um, a little bit. I mean, in the sense of not like, oh, I'm the League of Todd Berry, but like if I had yeah. to think of if you're like, oh, what kind of comic are you? are you? Are you like the Eddie Murphy type comedy? Are you Todd Berry type comedy? Are you Sinbad type comedy? Uh, I'd probably end up saying more like a Todd Berry comedy. Gotcha. Yeah. Do, and, do, do, like, do you feel comfortable in like certain aspects, like certain ways? Like, do you, like I, I asked you before, like about alt and stuff like that. Do you matter? Does a room matter to you or you just go in or? How does it yeah. work for you? Yeah. I mean, I, you always kind of just assess in a room, like, you know, am I in a cafe right now with not a lot of people? Uh, am I doing Philly's Funniest? Is it a comedy club? Um, you know, is it, are you doing something for a college? Um, I don't really change my material for that. Gotcha. No, it's just I'll put myself in a mental space of maybe I may need to project my voice more. Maybe I need to play around with the room more before getting into the bits. Maybe I have more room to play around with the room more, where some places it's like, all right, well, mainly just stick to the jokes. Um, but I don't know if that answers it, but I don't change my material for it. Yeah, I mean, that, that happens. Like, I feel like everybody, like, kind of caters a little bit. Like, I would do material, and I feel like I would do great. And the first time I felt like I fell flat on my face once was at Cave. Uh, and, okay. and it was, like, second half, basically all the people who probably came had gone and then it was just like children like 20 year old children yeah, temple students the, i'm sorry everyone was all over 21 <laughs> um, and uh i remember that, being like yeah, yeah. <laughs> i remember being like saying one of my fucking stupid jokes or whatever and you know my lean in or whatever and like i remember being like oh this is jokes for 30 year olds you know what I mean? This is like not like, you know what I mean? Right. This is not like, and I'm not trying to be that guy who's like, I don't know about TikTok, but like, I'm just saying like, there's a certain material. I'll be that guy. I don't know about TikTok. What's the deal with it? Uh, yeah. I'll write it down. That's my new bit. What's the deal with TikTok? Uh, this is a, lot of, a lot of pedophiles on it. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I was going to say that that is a thing. It's interesting, though, because all of us have seen Cave in various iterations or saw Cave in various formats. And um, I remember uh, second half and like I, I think that it the thing about Cave was that it, I thought it taught a lot of lessons because it like, you know, it had a, a big scale of things that it would hit over the course of a night. And one of it was that I, I remember Kurt, I remember Kirk, you had a, um, you, I remember you once went up like first half and did re, I, I remember I was hosting and you like, you killed the place, but it's oh, like, you. if you, if you had a, cause that was a room that I remember the big thing about it was that we, we were saying that in first half, everyone's listening. Everyone's was really listening in and was very much about the stage. They weren't eating food there. They're not drinking. Uh, the, the, hear that? They're not drinking. All right, all right. <laughs> they, uh, and they, uh, 
but that was the thing was, is if you had to like design a room like that, do you think that you're someone that, and I know it sounds ridiculous to say, do you want your audience to be listening? But like, is your ideal show in like, if you had to record like an hour special, is that in a library? Is that in a comedy club? Is that, you know, in a barn? I don't know. Where, where are you doing that kind of thing? You got me a library, baby. Uh, no, uh, yeah, it would be something like that. Um, like something like a cave or even like the UCB those in Chelsea, kind of like those small spaces um, where you could seat like 50 people. And the idea is that they are there, not even necessarily for comedy, but they're there for entertainment and they'll be attentive. Um, I think it's cool. Like you have places like, you know, say like a Raven lounge, which is cool. It's very much like a kind of like a club almost. So it's a different type of avenue. Um, that doesn't work as well for me, I find. Um, maybe because like I, I, I'm more on the quiet end and I very much like, all right, here is my thing. It's best to do it kind of uninterrupted, um, which sounds kind of like, oh, it's like PG comedy in a way, uh, but in a way kind of. Uh, so it's, I, I find it's better suited when they're there to listen and it's just for that. Yeah, I think you learn that in comedy too. It's like you'll do mics and then you get your first show and the feeling of your first show of people are there to listen. Oh yeah. Like, I don't know, it's head and shoulders above, you know what I mean? You're like, Oh, it's not just comics on their phone. Yeah. That I'm talking yeah. to, you know, at the whatever there's a great, it's one of my favorite comedy quotes. It's David telling, he says, um, he's like, yeah, comedy is like, uh, with some people it's like volleyball. I'll serve. You just be on your phone. Uh, mm like you yeah but it really is true I can imagine I, I feel like we all fit in the niche of like we want an audience who's actually there to listen like yeah. some people thrive on people not listening and like I, that to me is like amazing that someone can right. do that just turn it around but. yeah I find a lot of crowd work people are um, yeah. great with that and it's good practice I find yeah. and I, I was trying to think what would be the best audience to record in front of yeah, I was going to say I, what's your idea Honestly, an improv crowd. Like, if a crowd yeah. was there to see improv, because I find they're the most forgiving and willing to learn audience. Um, they're not really there to interrupt. And although it involves audience participation, that's where it ends for them most of the time. I've rarely, I've been to a bunch of improv shows, and I hardly ever see people heckling. Um, a lot of times they're younger too. Uh, I find I do well with improv crowds. Hmm. Very interesting. If I, I'll do... Yeah, do you, you ever, no, I'm sorry. Go sorry. ahead. I was going to say, have you ever found, did you ever do a show like that? Like, I found myself, like, sandwiched between two improv teams on, like, a primarily improv show. Have you ever done that kind of thing? Not strictly improv show, but I've done, like, talent shows where, like, it would be an improv group and someone playing the song from uh, Pitch Perfect or playing with Cups. Uh, it'd be like five contestants doing that. That was a popular thing at the time. Um, yeah. Most like, yeah, it, <laughs> it lived on up until 2015-ish. Like, <laughs> I remember yeah. doing a talent yeah. show in 2015 and that was some stuff that they did. Um, <laughs> sorry, I lost train of thought. <laughs> what was it? Talent? What's up? You did Bethlehem's Got Talent or something? <laughs> I did Kutztown's Got Talent. I got Kutztown's Got Talent. <laughs> I won Could Sounds Got Talent, wow. went on to host Could Sounds Got Talent, and then advanced to Berks County's Got Talent. Um, and that's yeah. where they, I think the person that did Cups, they were, they placed third in that one. So. <laughs> they were fucking sweeping that year. I remember Pitch Perfect ruined a lot of things. And one of them was, I was in my freshman year of college when Pitch Perfect came out and it gave all the acapella teams on our campus so much more confidence to go out in public and they would do like public like battle shit and i was like this fucking it was the lamest thing i had ever seen in my life was yeah. like fucking oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a like, little square at temple where they would all get together it was the dumbest shit it's goofy because that's how i feel about a lot of acapella too and then i started to look at them almost in a superior way once lip sync battles became popular, once oh, those came popular, I'm like, no, you're the worst. You're the absolute worst. This yeah. is the worst thing you could ever do. Um, we which hit our seemed, rock bottom. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, that's one of my terror. That's something I won't do in front of a crowd. 
like they have work events in my job i'm like i'm not no i'm not doing karaoke or lip syncing that's awful yeah i don't know Whatever. I know you, Jared, you like it. I see you guys at the Lizard Lounge. You guys uh, do karaoke I've done it a couple times. I don't really do, I don't, I don't do like salt, but I'll go because I don't know. I like alcohol, uh, mm. but like, okay. you know, I'll go, I'll go. And it's, it's fun to watch some people. It's like, uh, it's awesome though. It's like better than a mic sometimes. It's like oh. stuff that people will sing and like, and then, I don't know. It's like when someone goes up and they sing Papa Roach and they mean uh. it, there's nothing better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Don't you want to meet? Don't you mean when you go up and you sing Papa Roach? <laughs> yeah, or I sing. Um, I usually sing uh, Papa Roach, and then I sing that uh, song. Uh, I can't even think. Of. Some forty one. That's what song I was oh. trying to think of. I can't think. Uh, I pegged you as a POD guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, oh, that's about cut my life into pieces. That mm. uh, uh, I wanted to touch on this last time, uh, but I want to ask you this, Kurt, because you are a very nice guy. Oh, thanks, and, um, so this is a thing that I want to do. It's called uh, it's <laughs> it's called put them on a poster, dunk oh, on boy. a comedian, or if you don't want to do a comedian, I understand, but like it can be someone that you're never gonna interact with. Like you can talk about Jeff Dunham, but is there something a person in comedy, a subject in comedy, something you just don't want to see anymore? Um, I don't know if there's not if there's someone I don't want to see particularly. I'm not crazy about fart jokes um jokes. yeah not crazy about it not crazy i'm not super crazy about dick jokes either really? and i i, I kind of recognize they're like the fundamentals in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. i could appreciate them but i could think of maybe one or two times that i've actually like laughed at a dick joke it seems very much like bottom of the barrel um and it's, it's so prevalent and I, I guess it makes sense a lot of comics are men and men have penises um yeah. But it's just, I don't know, it always just reeked of laziness to me. Um, and same with fart jokes. It just, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's clever ways to do it, just like there's clever ways to tell dark jokes. Um, but I, that's one that I would like to see less of. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know the last time I heard a fart joke. Actually, yeah, I don't know the last time I heard a fart joke. I've heard poop yeah. jokes. I guess that's the same vein, though, right? Like a poop joke? Yeah. People just say they take a big shit, and then people are like, "Yeah, <laughs> they love." It's universal. People even like lie that they yeah took a big shit or something. <laughs> and there are some comics that have that have. Sarah Bell is that good joke where she's like, uh, "Men love it when I can eat a big meal, but I've yet to yeah, yeah. see a man that is impressed when I can take a big shit." Yeah, and that's like that's the only, that's like one that's funny, but it's like it's got so many other implications <laughs> behind it. That, that and the only other one I can think of is like that. Have you ever seen that Louis interview where he's talking about why farts are funny? And he's like, they're the sound of a trumpet that's been hanging out with your poop all day and they live in your ass. They're the uh, funniest okay. thing in the world. I don't know. The jury's out about if you want, if you take it with a grain of salt because of Louis, but like it is. I don't know. It's, it's, I definitely see the appeal of the subject. Do you have anything like that? Not to, not to throw us off of it, but like, That's do you have a subject that really is like your chum in the water where it's like you that's the area that you want to like move in and like the subject that you want to write about? Do you have anything like that? It'd be nice to be more observant of social interactions. Um, I have a background in communication studies and I find a lot of like human interaction interesting and just a lot of the terminology and studies behind it. I think like having a bit on nonverbal communication that would be cool. Um, I think something integrating that in my comedy would be cool. Um, I don't have much of it, at least on a conscious level right now, though. So you want to be a mime? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's such a simple way to put it. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I want to put myself in a box. I don't want to get out of that box, though. What's that? I'm doing 20 minutes. Okay, I'm in the box for 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes of that. Is there, there's a flamingo in my box now. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, that is that's another thing that I think is funny too. It's like in comedy is like I've um I I've like you you've been around all these comics. We've seen all the same comics together. You know what I mean? There's good people, there's bad people, it doesn't matter, whatever you want to call it. But sometimes even a good comic that I like, like a friend of mine, and they're like, Yeah, I'm doing 20 minutes on this thing, and I'm like, 20 minutes? Like that's 
so insane when anyone besides like like if you're Dan Soder do 25 minutes like you know what I mean but like when you're still like mics like that and you're like doing 20 minutes I'm like that's got to be rough and you know the comic I'm talking about David might not but um someone told me they recently did a set and like the joke was like uh, uh you know what I'm talking about he wears the hat uh and he was like my wife, last wife was so ugly I killed her. <laughs> it was like he had to revert to that. He was like doing jokes like that. So I just I always think of that as like, it like, do you think you have? Do you I'm trying to think of this hat person? <laughs> uh, do you think you have? It's just like, yeah, but I'm saying you said like the 20 minutes thing, but like you could do 20 minutes of your material, or do you think like that is like a thing that comes with time? Because that's like something that I've been meaning to ask comics. It's like. You can say you have 20 minutes of material, but do you have 20 minutes to engage everybody? Are you asking if I have 20 minutes of material yeah, like, or I think that's like, that's like the, do you agree that that's like the hardest thing? It's like 20, that's what I meant to say, sorry. But like having that full 20 minutes to engage somebody, 30 minutes, a whole hour where people are like, you know, like that's so hard. Yeah, no, and that's um, like, I don't have, an hour and that's still I see it almost like writing a novel where I'm like okay well I could write short stories I could write essays and papers but a whole novel you really did a whole novel and then you did another novel after that like that that still blows my mind um that's the Frank that's one the secondhand information or secondhand advice but Frank told me he hung out with Normand until like three in the morning or four in the morning at some diner and he said that he was just like, yes, yeah, stand up is you starting until you write your hour. Like oh. that's what you're working, your whole time is you're working towards your hour. But now I think things are changing with that kind of like the specials and stuff like that. But like, no, oh, it's pretty crazy. Like think about how much time you put into it on top of how much time you do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you spend eight hours uh, a month writing for five minutes on stage. Mm. yeah it's interesting when you break it down of that way of like you know you're driving two hours out um in some cases you're flying out you're getting hotels you're doing all this time writing sending all this mental energy for what can be no more than 20 minutes sometimes um yeah no it's it's interesting when you break it down that way it's worth it depending on you know what it is like i'm not going to drive five hours for five minutes yeah. Like if they're like, there's a, there's a showcase in Boston and we got, I got a hot five minutes for you. Like, no, I don't, I don't know. There's so many different <laughs> avenues yeah. for comedy at this point. I believe um, we've all done that where we've driven or done something so crazy to do yeah, five so minutes. Far. It's like, uh, I think I drove a total of four hours to do 15. Wow. One of the last times I did comedy. Well, it was like two hours there and two hours back. But um, really, oh god. Yeah, someone asked me to be on the show, and I did it. It was a great show. I did. Yeah. I should have taped like at least like audio or whatever, you know. But like, yeah, I don't know. That's comedy. You put so much effort into it. And I feel. Yeah. Like. You said 2011. You've been doing comedy. Yeah, first time I ever did uh, comedy, 2011, and then I want to say that time spent at Fairmont was probably 2012, 2013-ish. Mm-hmm. then moved to Kutztown, started college over there. Um, I was in Monco for uh, Montgomery County Community College, for those of you that don't know, uh, for a while, and then transferred over to Kutztown. And while at Kutztown, that's when I really started to go out to like more and more mics and started to get on shows and doing things in Bethlehem, you know, Lehigh Valley, Reading. Um, it's interesting because uh, I'm curious on your guys' take with this of like, you know, there's a lot of times it's like, oh, this is when you started comedy, but then it's like, oh, but then like whether I had a surgery or something happened where I took a break and then come back to it, it there's always seems to be kind of disagreements on when's the start time for your comedy um, and how long you've been actually doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, David? Yeah. Oh, um, well, it's actually, it's interesting because I had a few different experiences. I started doing stand-up while I was in college and um, it was like, um, I mean, it was just like a weekly thing for a while because I was under 21 and I was in Philly. So it was like, I guess it was kind of hard to find things that were under 21, 
and I got kicked out of like a lot of different places, but nice. there was a, there, there was definitely like a, um, there was like, I, I went on a study abroad program uh, for a while and I didn't do any stand up while I was there. And then I also- uh, a you study like, abroad or yeah. two? Oh. <laughs> Z- none, zero. <laughs> you almost zero. pulled out the note cards British, for that one. Zoop. British, <laughs> British women are hard. British women are go- nothing. Yeah. And Where then, were you? I also, I have, what? Where were you? Uh, London. Mm. I feel like you got a chance there. You would think that. <laughs> but, uh, this, if, you were like, if you were Barcelona and you were 20-year-old David in Barcelona, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. But like <laughs> London. Eh. Well, you would think that, but uh, maybe I didn't try hard enough. Maybe whatever. Just saying, uh, just, London, I don't not I don't the best looking people. Dig into it. I don't, I don't want to dig it into it too, too hard. There's some good looking people there because it's a wealthy city. So I feel like people well, just come in. The models visiting, but whatever. Uh, oh, the models visiting. <laughs> That's what you're going for. I'm just anyway, glad. I also... <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. I, um, yeah, so no sex. Um, but I, uh, <laughs> I also had like, um, I had a time that was interesting, like when I could have really stopped. And it was when I, uh, when I, uh, I, tore up my ACL like a year ago I and, and it was interesting because I somebody was like like I think my mom was like you're not going to do comedy for a little while right but as soon as I got back into town I like went up and I did tattooed comedy like the day after I had surgery and it was super fucking weird because yeah. I, I, I like hobble up the stairs and shit like that but you know what I honestly I I like those more than anything it's like if you have an injury and you still go out and do it, I think that that's a sign that you really enjoy it, yeah. whatever you're doing. That's what's up. I remember you had a boot for a little bit. Now that you mention it, the first time I saw you yeah, in the cave, had you had a boot. Yeah, I fucking brace down my whole yeah. life. Yeah, was, yeah that's like, right. Hard. You had like the, like the, you look like a skier, like when they have you, in, like you're in the, um, <clears throat> that's David's agent. He's trying to find a better podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to say that Benny Hill yeah. is dead. Uh, can't we're about to hit the. I think we might <laughs> hit it now, or we're gonna, we're gonna, or we just hit at the hour mark. So I want to uh, ask you one more thing. Um, so obviously, like in the situation that we're currently in, where no one's doing stand up uh, right now, do you have any ideas? Do you think what's going to happen here? Do you think it's going to come back soon? Do you think that we're all just, yeah, yeah, huh? I like stand up if it's going to come back soon. No, uh, no, uh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Okay. Uh, the answer both very soon, both of them. Uh, no, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to come back this summer. Um, we're in April right now. Uh, I, I can't see it. You know, once the country opens back up, I think people like David was saying, like if they really enjoy it, they're going to try to find ways to do it. So I think we're going to start seeing uh, perhaps rooms where they're going to be practicing social distance of like, all right, it's a small room, speakeasy, only letting 15 people in, little appetizers of comedy. And then who knows what that'll look like in the fall. They're saying supposedly all this may come back. Um, so it's interesting. I Part of me before was saying that I hope we don't utilize virtual mics and virtual comedy too much because it's going to become the norm. Um, I don't really like the idea of that for comedy, but if that's what we have for right now, people are still holding it together. They're still creating content. Some people are creating more content than they were before uh, the pandemic. So that part's pretty interesting to see and how people are adapting to you know doing their comedy in their room. Yeah, uh, but you can see my purple curtains. I can't bring yeah. my purple curtains to Philly. That's nice. Uh, so yeah. you know, that's kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I, th- I think the same thing. I do think it's kind of weird that some people are like kind of protesting the virtual comedy because through Zoom, you can hear people, blah, blah, blah. But like at the same time, when you record a podcast or you do a man on the street thing, you know what I mean? The reaction is like you have to wait for the reaction. You know what I mean? Like when Conan goes out and asks somebody questions, that's the audience laughing. That's not the audience laughing while he's in Zimbabwe. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I'm saying it's like, I see what you're saying. It's kind of, it's going to go towards that. But I think it like, I think you're right. Everything will open. It'll go back. It might be not as soon. I do think hypochondria is going to skyrocket. I think there's going to be a lot of people who want to stay home. I think 
virtual stuff will become like a wave of the future. You know, sports will be played without people. But do you do you guys think that it will cheapen comedy in any way? Cheap in comedy, whether it's the content or um, people that you wouldn't necessarily see do the drive to go out to Max. Uh, it's more of that because they're in the comfort of their home. You know what? I think, you know what I think is going to skyrocket is fucking stupid, shitty content. I think even when something small happens, so, people take advantage of the moment in any way that they can. And that's my main annoyance is knowing how pissed off I'm going to be at a mic, at a show, when someone's got like coronavirus material in like a year. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like the yeah. things that are going to be so stale after a little while. And I, I don't know, I, I don't think it'll be cheapened. I think, look, I think the same standards are gonna be there and stuff like that. I just, I hope, what I hope is the positive side of it is that I hope that people just take away like a, a moment to just like, sit down and really write something like if you really know what you're doing you could come out of this with like material that's not about coronavirus like yeah. I, I feel like uh, all of us are trying to make stuff right now the people that are good it seems like are doing things that aren't really so much about this whole thing because everybody knows that it's there and i think that the escapism side of it is what i hope comes forward a little bit more mm, that we just yeah. we get into it because it's not coronavirus and we yeah. get into it because it's not death or disease and things like that yeah most know. definitely no I, I hope the same um I, I don't want to hold you guys up too much i know we're pushing on an hour but i wonder of uh, you know the big thing with comedy is like the whole pc culture stuff i wonder how that adapts to virtual comedy because uh, yeah. you know a lot of times you're more prone to be vitriolic if you're in person and you hear someone say something you don't like virtual comedy you have to make the effort to like log in like sit there and then like you have to like what unmute your mic to heckle like you can't like i'm wondering if that will go away in, in a grand scheme of a pandemic something like pc culture and just being uh politically correct is going to be seen as trivial almost yeah i think people's um i think people's viewpoints will change in a bit where it's like what's serious and what's not serious you know at this point like we're seeing that like people are dying and you know, in mass, I don't know another way to say it, you know, like, um, and it's awful and you can make jokes about it and so on and so forth. And then like, it's the same thing. It's like when you make a cancer joke and someone's like, my grandmother died of cancer. I don't know what person from Brooklyn is now heckling, but, uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, fine. We get it. But like, now I think, now I think people are going to be like, fuck man. Like I went through some shit. And I want to laugh. So maybe it'll be fine for a while and it'll peter off and blah, blah, blah. But I think we'll get like that morning fog a little bit of like where people can kind of say some jokes and stuff like that. But like the other thing with that is like, I don't want to get in this whole debate or whatever, but like, I don't know one malicious comic that I respect that goes up and says stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's not a I lot think, of them. Yeah. And I think but if they, a comic they get it, they says, get it. Yeah, and I think if a comic said something and someone was offended who was a comic would be like, hey man, like there's a better word for that. Like comedy knows how to police yeah. itself that way. The people I think that you're talking about, sorry if I'm speaking for you, are just people on the internet looking for something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, um, a lot of times like the, I'll frame it as the blog writers. Um, I say it as if like I've had millions of blogs written about me. <laughs> like, oh, did you hear about Kirk's Bozo bit? We got to put an end to this. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, I think, yeah, that's, I no longer do that bit. It's, it's too rough, too rough for the streets. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. And who knows, maybe we'll see less of it. And maybe if we start to see more of it, that'll be a sign of things going back to normal. So, yeah, I don't think people will be like the censor thing or whatever. You know what I mean? I think it'll be, I think it'll be go back. There's still going to be flame war. Yeah. And I'm not there's saying like. more right fucking now. Yeah, yeah, I'm. Yeah, like. Ugh, man. You say flame war. Yeah, flame war. What's a flame war? Just like uh, somebody, somebody in PCN the other day uh, posted something that was like obviously meant to like uh, make 
aggressive moves out of uh, like more liberal comics and shit like that. I know who you're referring to. I know you're referring. Yeah, to yeah. Okay. We all know what it is. Name but, Ryan Lee Yox or something. <laughs> whatever it is, and it was just that's like one of the things where I was like, if, people being on their computers all day is not going to change this kind of thing. I would say that the only thing that like worries me is that like people people need this, you know? Like people, I feel like people need stand up comedy. And look, I like what we're doing with virtual shows, and I think Cat mostly put it best, and Satorio as well is when we were, we were all talking once and they said, um, they said, this is entertainment, but it is not stand-up comedy. If you're in your house, it's not stand-up comedy. And I, I agree that it's, yeah. it's definitely, the, the virtual shows are good and it's a nice sort of, you know, it's the nice soy version of whatever it is that mm -hmm. we want to be doing. But it's, it's gonna be really interesting, I think, to see everybody coming off of this like proto version of things, you know, this fake meat of comedy. And then if we have to, if we, if we ever get to jump back into what we knew from before, you know, I mean, yeah. comedy is one of the most, it's like a germaphobes fucking nightmare. And mm -hmm. honestly, shout out to Sonia, uh, who ran, who was running a uh, Raven lounge. And I remember right before everybody was like told to quarantine and like shelter in place and things, she was the only one wearing a mask, holding the mic with the with the gloves on things nice. like that and like legitimately it was, she was the only one and I, I remember i was there and i was like what the fuck is going on and i i eat my words now because i because <laughs> she really was ahead of the curve she knew exactly what was up so sad. Yeah. i'm i'm i mean yeah i'm excited to like when it comes back and what, what's gonna oh, yeah. happen and like Oh man, I, I can't wait for the bits. I can't wait to hear the old bits. Like the stuff I know. a million times, I just want to hear somebody say it. You know, yeah. I just, uh, I can't, I can't wait for that. And like, um, you know, what's funny is like, I will add this is like my favorite thing is like, um, people were like talking about, oh, it's like 9-11. It is nothing like 9-11 other than the fact that something has happened that is awful. And now we have to go back to normalcy. That's it. There's no other comparison other than that now saying it makes me feel like it's sort of like 9-11 um but uh i think it's like the first like the second biggest thing if for our generation like 9-11 was like whoa yeah. that's a way beyond me thing i think this pandemic it kind of uh, resembles that in that sense yeah yeah and i think also we think about like comedy is so different from pre-9-11 to post-9-11 i bet that this will probably have an effect yeah in some mm. regard right? there's a great like, we have to... joke like that he says uh he says that after 9-11 the only people in new york were uh comedians and uh drunk jersey girls uh like doing a bridesmaid thing they're like we're not gonna let them mess up your day like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing like yeah but no, I think that's what it's going to come back to. I think people are going to be happy. Like, yeah, it's going to be fucking different. I think it's going to be a bummer if they're going to be like, yeah, we're going to let 20 people into this open mic or something. You know what I mean? Like, maybe signups are going to happen. I don't know. I don't even think but then that. Again, 20 people, 20 people would be amazing for some open mics, you know? Yeah. Like, some, know. some open mics would be like, 20 people? Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. Do you guys feel as if your self-esteem has been hit? As in, like, I know a lot of people are saying they identify their self-value with stand-up and not having that anymore right makes up. them very, very sad. How are you two feeling about that? Mm. Oh, I just want to honestly... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. David, go. No, I, I was going to say uh, the, the best thing about it, I would say, I, I would say that, look, I understand that it, it is a worldwide tragedy and a very serious situation, but, like, not having feelings of FOMO anymore or like worrying that you're not at enough shows and things like that. Definitely. I mean, that pressure is like almost entirely gone. And I would say that that in terms of the comedy community has been sort of a nice little bit of a blessing. I just, I feel more centered than I ever have before. It's, it's definitely given me a lot more opportunities to keep a clear head. Sorry, Jared. I didn't mean to no, no, that's fine. Yeah. I'm just excited. I'm just excited. This sounds insane coming from me, but uh, like, um, I don't know if ego will be there anymore. Ego. For a lot of people. I think okay. like people will go through a lot and then they'll get back to a show or a mic or whatever, any comedy sort of gathering that, you know, and then like to me, uh, RIP Chris Cotton, but I remember starting comedy in Philadelphia and walking into a room and he'd be like, hey man, what's up? And other comedians who were not even a fucking, you know, pimple on that dude's ass 
were not cool, were such cool guys to me. And right. that guy, and I think like the embodiment of like what Cotton and like certain good comics, like that, like who they were as like saying hello and stuff like that. I think that niceness might come back too, which would be pretty cool to me. That like, would be cool. Yeah, I try to still, like when I hosted stuff, I would be like, hey, you're next, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, hey, how are you? Is it your first time? You know what I mean? Like, because, and I'm like, I'm hoping that does come back. But yeah, like there's ball busting. I miss ball busting, you know, mm. like that, fucking around. But either way, I mean, that's interesting have, ego. Yeah. Um, but Kirk, thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate it. Yeah, this is cool, man. Thanks, Mike, both of you for you, uh, having me on. You have a you have an arsenal of stuff you kind of do. I know a lot of stuff is canceled now, but like uh, you want some like stuff. Uh, I'll be doing a, a, a virtual version of Feud, the Merrily Show, uh, this Wednesday on a, what is it, the 29th? No, April 30th. No, it's April 29th uh yeah april 29th feud uh and i'm doing an open mic set in jersey on sunday okay. uh so if you want to go check out an open mic in jersey on sunday mm-hmm. uh i'm probably going to be posting that link on my facebook and such right. but uh, mainly you know, check check me out on property bonics and uh instagram of captain keith 24 proper bonics podcast it's really proper good bonics uh okay. all right well thank you for stopping by keith i appreciate it this has been So Tell Us Podcast with uh, David Feinberg and Jared McCallie. We are happy that you tune in, the three people who've told me they've tuned in so far. All right. Uh, later. We go every week, baby. Here we go. Okay. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, still recording. Yeah, I know.